Within this ancient city once stood the first and second Jewish temples, making Jerusalem the focus of the spiritual longing of all Orthodox Jews. From the Dome of the Rock, Muslims believe that Muhammad ascended up to heaven on a celestial steed, which made Jerusalem forever sacred in the sight of Muslims. And since many of the events in the life of Jesus happened in Jerusalem, it is hallowed ground for Christians as the birthplace of Christianity. When you consider how important the old city of Jerusalem has been to Jews, Christians, Muslims for thousands of years, the visitor to the city may be surprised to find just how small the old city is. In fact, Mark Twain, who came through these gates in 1869, claimed that you could walk entirely around the circumference of the city in one hour if you walked briskly. But these walls are less than 500 years old, built by the Turkish ruler Suleiman the Magnificent. During its long history, Jerusalem has been completely destroyed twice and captured 44 times. The walls, gates and buildings have been destroyed and rebuilt many times. This is Damascus Gate, one of Jerusalem's busiest and most ornately decorated gates. There are six other gates into Jerusalem, making seven entrances in all. An eighth gate, known as the Golden Gate, was sealed off by Suleiman in 1541. According to Jewish prophecy, this is the gate through which the Messiah will enter Jerusalem. So Suleiman sealed it off, hoping to prevent the Messiah from doing so. Just a little south of where I'm standing here by the Golden Gate, is an area known as the Offal. The Offal means a fortified hill or a risen area. And just immediately south of the Offal is another hill where the city of Jebus once stood. These ruins are all that remain of the Jebusite city before King David besieged and captured Jebus in 1003 BC and renamed it Jerusalem. David brought the sacred Ark of the Covenant into the city, establishing Jerusalem as the center of Judaism. David longed to build a house for God where he could place the Holy Ark. So he bought a farmer's threshing floor from a Jebusite named Averna for 50 shekels of silver. And this was to be the site of the splendid new temple. But God told David that he was not to be the one to build the new temple. Instead, his son Solomon would be given the task. This is what Solomon's temple may have looked like in his day. Solomon's beautiful temple stood for nearly 400 years until in 586 BC, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar conquered and plundered Jerusalem and Solomon's temple was burned. In approximately 700 BC, 100 years before Cyrus was born, the prophet Isaiah prophesied that a king named Cyrus would allow the temple to be rebuilt after Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed it. Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled in 536 BC when the Persian king Cyrus allowed the Jews in captivity to return to Jerusalem under the leadership of Nehemiah. And after the walls were rebuilt, a second Jewish temple was built on the foundation of Solomon's temple by the Jewish leader Zerubbabel. A full 500 years passed before Herod the Great ordered a massive reconstruction and embellishment of the temple. This is a detailed model of Jerusalem and Herod's temple constructed in 1973 by the famous historian Michael Aviori on display in the gardens of the Israeli Museum. In 69 AD, Titus, the son of Roman Emperor Vespasian, marched on Jerusalem to suppress a Jewish rebellion. And in 70 AD, Titus torched the entire city and the second Jewish temple went up in flames. Since then, for nearly 2,000 years, there's been no Jewish temple standing in Jerusalem. But still, thousands of people every day make their way to the Western Wall widely believed to have once been part of the actual temple complex. Here, the Jewish people come to mourn the destruction of their temple. 
Here they can contemplate the many hardships they have endured throughout their history and pray for the return of the glory of their ancient past. No trees can be planted in the courtyard as long as the third and final temple remains unbuilt. After the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD, the Jews never rebuilt a third temple during all those years. But why? I'm joined by Robert Mandelbaum, who's an eschatologist and Bible researcher. Robert, why was this? Why have the Jews never rebuilt their temple? Well, thanks for having me, Chris. It's great to be here. After 70 AD, the Jews were scattered throughout all of the world, and there came a time when Jews were not even allowed to live or visit Jerusalem. They wanted, of course, to rebuild their temple, and thanks to the Temple Institute, which is just behind us, all the plans are already made. The uh, sacrificial altar has been recently constructed. The priest's robes have been made. Pretty much everything is ready to go. Robert, help us understand why is it so important to the Jewish religion to rebuild their temple? What is the significance of the temple to them? Well, Chris, there's many important reasons, but the primary reason, the number one reason, is the Jewish people do not believe their Messiah will arrive until that temple is rebuilt. So what's the problem? With everything set and ready to go, what's to stop the third temple being built? Well, the problem is that building you see over there above the Western Wall. It's called the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock was built by the Arab Caliph Abd al-Malik in 691 AD. It stands on what is known as the Temple Mount on the Haram al-Sharif. The Haram al-Sharif is currently the site of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which has a silver dome, and the Dome of the Rock, which has a golden dome. And it has a tradition from the 12th century of being the place where Muhammad's uh, stepped off of uh, the earth and onto his horse and then the horse was taken up into heaven and so was Muhammad. Uh, that's a very late source. It is not from the Quran and but it's a tr traditional Muslim source. It's a the harem that a lot of people call it the Temple Mount, Dome of the Rock, the Alaska Mosque. It's this, uh, this incorporated area that I call the Temple Mount platform that is 36 acres that's up on the Temple Mount area and uh, it's uh, controlled and uh, managed by the Muslims and the Jews desperately would love to build their temple there. They believe it's somewhere up on that platform. A lot of people say it's the south or the north or they're, they're, all, they're, all, they're not really sure to where the temple was but most people, most people will say that is the area of where Solomon's and Herod's temples once rested. But what if the Jewish temples never stood on the Temple Mount where the Dome of the Rock now stands. Robert is one of a number of leading Bible experts and researchers that believe that this is indeed the case. Well, Chris, if you look at 2 Samuel chapter 24 and 2 Chronicles chapter 3, they will show you the exact location of where Solomon's temple was built. The thing that's important to understand is the place that David bought from Arbana the Jebusite with a threshing floor. The rock under the Dome of the Rock in no way resembles a threshing floor. It's a rough hewn rock full of holes and just very uneven and no farmer would ever use that as a threshing floor. What we're really talking about here is the Bible specifically telling us where the temple was built and scripture is telling us that the temple was built in the city of David more specifically in the Jebusite fortress on the threshing floor of Ornan, which is, I would assume, would be very close to the Gion Springs in some respects. So Robert, if the Jewish temples never stood where the Dome of the Rock now stands, then where were they built? Well, they were built several hundred feet south of the Dome of the Rock in an area called the Awful. And all you have to do is study some verses out of Nehemiah chapter 2 and Nehemiah chapter 3 and again, it pinpoints and gives a very clear description of where the temple was built. The key word in that verse, Nehemiah 2.15, is brook. I went up by the brook. And if you look at Nehemiah 3.7, it uses the word river. There's only one brook, one river, one stream within five square miles of Jerusalem. There is no river, no brook, no running water on the Haram el Sharif. The only place in all of Jerusalem where there is running water is the Gihon Spring. And where is the Gihon Spring in relation to where we're sitting now? Well, the Gihon Spring is just a few hundred feet 
south of where we are presently sitting. Do you want to take us down there? Yeah, let's go. We've come now down to the Gihon Spring, which flows out of Hezekiah's Tunnel. First of all, tell us about Hezekiah's Tunnel. Well, Hezekiah's Tunnel was, of course, built during the reign of King Hezekiah, when Jerusalem was under imminent attack from the Assyrians. Hezekiah took the Gihon Spring, built this tunnel, and channeled the waters of the Gihon through the tunnel which you see before us. And what is the relevance of the Gihon Spring in relation to where the temple uh, once stood. Well, when the Ark was in Shiloh and David brought the Ark from Shiloh, he placed it at the Gihon Spring. King Solomon was anointed king at the Gihon Spring. And when King Solomon, of course, became king, he built his temple, King Solomon's temple, which was built up the hill from where we're standing on the offal. So the waters of the Gihon Spring are very pure. Well, they were at one time, but in 1067, there was a major earthquake in which 25,000 people were actually killed. The topography of the area was changed and the waters of the Gihon became bitter. So the Gihon, and it's, it's amazing, a, a siphon spring, one of only maybe a dozen in the whole world that worked that way. So it's an amazing water system that you have there. Uh, Gihon means gusher, because what would happen several times a day, this water would be gushing out of there. And like I said, if you look in any ancient tell, a tell is an ar archeological, you know, uh, artificial mound, you need four things to make a city. You have to have food, water, road, and defense. Any ancient city had to have that. In Jerusalem, there's only one water source. One. There's not two. There's not five. There's not three. There's one water source, and not a small source. One major water source, the Gihon, the gusher. The Gihon spring was very unique in structure. It is literally a siphon spring and well-known to ge geologists and hyd hydrologists of being something that can literally pump something a great height. The Gihon Spring is similar to uh, geysers, like Old Faithful, but without the heat, that it could pump water 40 stories, 400 feet, from the bottom of the Gihon up into the temple. And there are five historical sources that tell us that it actually happened, that there was a fountain inside the temple. Besides the biblical information, the biblical sources from Joel, Ezekiel, and from uh, the Psalms, several Psalms, put it all together and there was a fountain in the temple at the top of the city of David on the top of Mount Zion at that, at that temple. And it also existed in, this, in the reconstruction by King Herod. Well, the Gion Spring has been an, is an ancient water source that's been talked about uh, going way back to the time of uh, Solomon. Uh, the, the springs uh, are still running today. They're not of the force of water that they were a long time ago. A lot of the, a lot of, uh, you know, Jerusalem has been dug up and the rock uh, might have, through fracturing and modern construction, have uh, precipitated that. But the Gion Springs has been this, this ribbon of water that's the lifeblood of the city of David. It's like water pumping through the veins of a, of a, of a human. The city of David has this water pumping through it, which gives his life and, and gave it. The reason that David even took it was probably that water source. But, it's a, but you need to have flowing water in the ceremonial of the cleansing of several things. The priests going in the temple to worship. You need spring water to add to the ashes of the red heifer for purification. So water is essential, and there's no water on the Temple Mount, to tradi the traditional Temple Mount up above. They've uncovered the real pool of Siloam. They just did this in the last couple of years. It's an amazing story how they found it. But what was interesting, I was down there with the archaeologist who actually found it, and he told me that that area was an acre big. And his words, not mine, he said it's the world's largest mikvah. It went off in my head, of course. 10,000 people would be mikvering there. So the fact, if you're mikvering and you're, you're getting ceremonially clean down there, does it make any sense that you're gonna walk a third of a mile and maybe be unclean again? So the temple would have to be close to the mikvah, particularly that it's the biggest mikvah in the world, a 10,000 person acre mikvah 
where the Pool of Siloam is. And yet they found the stairs now, the original stairs from the Herodian period that go back up toward the city of David where the temple would have been. So if the temple stood over the Gihon Spring, then how did the buildings up on the Haram al-Sharif, how did they get their water? Well, there's 37 cisterns up there. They're very big. It's not fresh running water, but it's where they collected fresh water that could be used for Titus's 10th uh, legion. And the Gihon Spring actually represents the water flowing from the throne of God in Revelations 22. It flows from under the uh, uh, Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, and of course the uh, Shekinah glory uh, was between the wings of the two cherubim, which was on the mercy seat. We're here in the city of David, uh, where so many things happened in the Bible. And very interesting that, do you know, just 100 years ago, nobody knew this was Mount Zion. Most people thought up to the north of here was Mount Zion. And it was actually by an accident that they even found out that this was Mount Zion uh, by finding the tunnel that goes into where Hezekiah's tunnel is. So if they could get Mount Zion wrong for all these years, the most important mountain in the Bible, could it be possible that they could possibly get wrong the location of the temple. The historian Josephus actually proves this. Many people will say, oh, Josephus exaggerated. Josephus wasn't true in what he was saying. But when you realize that where we're standing here in the city of David was really where the temple was, and just to the north of me, where the harem is, was actually the Fort Antonia, Josephus' writings not only become reliable, but they re become most accurate. Josephus told us that the ridge we're standing on, which would have been the northern tower of the temple, was exactly 600 feet from valley to valley. Here we are standing here. This area we're standing here from valley to valley is exactly 600 feet. Not 610 or 620 or 580, but exactly 600 feet, exactly like Josephus said. But most importantly, in the last 18 years, they've been doing digs here. And those digs, at least in my estimation, have proved what Dr. Martin's theory was and what many other people are coming to the conclusion that the area we're standing in right now, in the upper part of the city of David, the awful area, was indeed where the temple was. Well, I wanted to film this part of the interview on the Haram al-Sharif, but of course you're not allowed to film there. So we're at a scenic spot by the old city walls. But Robert, I want to ask you, what is the Haram al-Sharif? What does it actually mean? Haram al-Sharif means noble sanctuary. It's where the Dome of the Rock is located, as well as the al Ask Mosque. It's the third most holy place in the Islamic religion. And it's quite a wide area. So back before the Dome of the Rock, the al Aqsa Mosque were built uh, back in the time of Jesus and the time of the temples. If the temples weren't standing there, then what was up there in that large area? Well, that was Fort Antonia, and that's where Titus housed the 10th Legion, which consisted of 6,000 soldiers and approximately 4,000 support staff. And Dr. Ernest L. Martin, in his book, The uh, Temples at Jerusalem Forgot, it goes at this from every single angle and leaves absolutely no doubt whatsoever that that was not the temple area, but Fort Antonia. And David, in this illustration from David Sealoff's website will show you the relationship between the, uh, the, the temple and the fort. In fact, there was a causeway connecting the fort to the temple. Well, Robert, what about the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall, as it's more correctly known? I mean, the Western Wall is venerated by Jews and millions worldwide. Are you telling me that the Western Wall has nothing to do with the Jewish temple? That's correct, Chris. It has absolutely nothing to do with the Jewish temple. The Western Wall is the Western Wall of Fort Antonia. Actually, it's part of the retaining wall with additional stones above the, uh, the larger, much larger foundational stones up to about six levels, eight levels. It depends where along the structure this, this is all established. And these uh, 
stones of the Wailing Wall are actually used and presumed to be the western wall of the temple, but it's not. The western wall today, uh, a very interesting uh, thing happened there recently is a, a man by the name of Eli Shukran, who's the director of archaeology, found a coin underneath the very lowest stone, where the stones reach bedrock under the western Wailing Wall. And a lot of people have been arguing how old this was. Well, kind of it was settled because Eli Shukran dug underneath and found underneath the lowest stone that re re reaches bedrock. He found a coin of Valerius Gratus, who was the prefect of Rome under Tiberius Caesar. The coin dated to 20 AD. Very interesting because Herod died in 4 BC. So 24 years after Herod's death, we have this wall being built attributed to Herod which poses a lot of very interesting questions as to who really built this wall and why did they build it. Omar and his family have owned the old city of Jerusalem's most famous antique jewelry shop for nine generations dating back 388 years. His shop has a dazzling variety of antiques and coins that have been unearthed in numerous excavations in Jerusalem over the years, including from the supposed Temple Mount area. I asked Omar if any artifacts or other evidence had ever been found that proved the Jewish temples stood there. Actually, regardless of the excavation or excavation that started for, after the war from 1967, uh, we know and everybody knows uh, through the experts that they brought and from all over the world, the historians, and f through uh, a pretty much like uh, digging in every spot, in every centimeters, you know, they flip everything, even each inch was digged, you know, they couldn't find any evidence that the temple mount is, uh, is beneath the Haram Sharif or what they call the Temple Mount now. And that's, that's a fact, you know, everybody knows that, you know. I think that all those stones that are up there today that you see uh, on the Haram or from a Roman fortress, of course there's been a lot of additions since then of people that have come in and conquered, moved around, but basically a lot of those, I think, uh, most of them were uh, generally part of a Roman fort called Fortress Antonio, named after Mark Anthony. It housed the 10th Roman legions, which was about 6,000 soldiers and about 4,000 support personnel. It would have been like a city up there. Uh, Josephus, in fact, describes it as being the size of several cities. But we see the Roman forts. We don't, don't see a couple of pub tents and a bunch of people walking around with spears and, and shields. You, it, was, it, was a, it, it was a machine. They had roads. They had bakeries. They had brothels. They had courtrooms. They had barracks. They had... It, it, was like a, it was like a city, and today we've never found any, any re remnants of where the Roman fort was. And of course the fort would have been quite large, and I think archaeology would have revealed something by now if it was located somewhere other than on the Temple Mount. Another reason that Hiram couldn't be the temple is when we look at the historical records. Let's go to Josephus. Josephus clearly said that the city was so raised that you would never even know a city stood there. And we see it when we, we go in ancient Jerusalem, you see that everything was destroyed from that time period. Uh, in the New Testament, Yeshua said the same thing. He said not one stone would be upon another. And there, in what they're calling the Temple Mount, the Harem, uh, you have 10,000 Herodian stones, 10,000. So not only do you have 10,000 stones that aren't supposed to be there, but if that's the temple and not the Fort Antonia, the stones should not be Herodian stones at the base, they should be Solomonic stones. So that fact alone that there's no Solomitic stones, but they did find the Solomitic stones in the city of David, and they did find the tower uh, that Nehemiah built. They found it there. They have the arche archaeological evidence of the uh, oil lamps and the pottery from the Persian era from that time. Clearly shows that the temple had to be in the city of David and not in the harem. Antonia, which we believe is the Harem Sharif, or the Harem Sharif was the remnants of Fort Antonia, encompasses an area of 36 acres. And basically, it is the size of a typical Roman fortress, according to schematics and even remnants of other permanent Roman fortresses all over Europe, in Germany, and other places, uh, even in, in Africa. The fort that was built by King Herod of, of Israel is typical of a Roman fortification built to their specifications of that time period. Another thing that most of the historians have neglected is the fact of 
Josephus tells us the size of the temple. The size of the temple was 600 feet square. It was a square. It's very, very uh, simple when you look at the records. Now, it was enlarged by Herod, but certainly not to the point of the size that you see the harem. Now, the interesting thing, when you look at the size of the harem, it's 96% exactly the size of every ancient Roman fort. And remember, the Roman fort was the property of the Roman Empire. Just like today, the United States of America has hundreds of bases in different countries. Those bases are owned by the United States of America, even though they're in a foreign country. And it was the same thing in this time. So uh, when you're looking at that fort, it, not only the this, this size of it had to be standard, but also remember that in an area where Jews were not intermingling with Romans, it had to be big enough that you can house uh, your, your, at least a legion of soldiers that you, beside the soldiers that you had, you had to have personnel that was working. You had a red light district. You had to have restaurants. You had to have probably 10 to 15,000 people. And whenever you look at a model of Jerusalem, like you saw in, in, in Jerusalem by uh, Yonah, they always make Fort Antonia this tiny little fort that couldn't probably hold 100 people. The model that we have at the Israeli Museum is a beautiful model. It, it, it's a great piece of art but a poor piece of historical reflection. Uh, for instance, I believe that the Roman fort there is uh, ridiculous. Uh, it's just this little appendage. The mighty Roman fortress has been reduced to this small little caricature that they have there uh, in that model. So I don't think that the model maker there made an accurate representation. But what he did do is he's impregnated into the mind of a lot of visitors a warped concept of the size of the Roman fortress and where the Roman fortress is. I'm really surprised that most people don't go up and say, this is ridiculous. What do we have this here for, this size and this dimensions? The Roman fortress was immense. And it wasn't just this small little appendage that they have there. Because we know that they had the 10th Roman Legion, which was about 10,000 people. That, that area could have held maybe a couple hundred people that we have at the, the model at the, at the Israeli Museum. And even in the New Testament, when you look at the Apostle Paul, when Paul, now they don't even know who he is. They're thinking he's this Egyptian that did this. And here it is, this nobody, because there was a plan to kill him on the way to Caesarea. They send 450 soldiers and, and accompaniment with him. Now, if there was only 600 soldiers in that fort, is it logical that almost every single person in the fort is going to go with an unknown person that they don't even know who he is? Of course not. So that alone shows us there were thousands of people. I mean, Jerusalem was a place where there was a lot of trouble going on, particularly at Holy Days, and there were thousands of troops that had to be there to quench any kind of trouble that would come. And like I said, the dimensions of the harem being exactly the dimensions of every Roman fort and completely opposite of any dimension of the Temple Mount that's told to us in the historical records is another proof that that just couldn't be the Temple Mount. We're on the Mount of Olives overlooking the old city of Jerusalem where we get a very clear view. Uh, Robert, tell us, how was the city of Jerusalem different 2,000 years ago than what we see here today? Well, of course, Chris, the uh, Dome of the Rock would not have been there. And what you're looking at was never the old city of Jerusalem. Those walls represent Fort Antonia, where Titus housed the 10th Legion, which eventually destroyed all of Jerusalem, and the uh, temple itself. Where I'm pointing right here, where that clump of trees are, which today is called the uh, City of Zion, which is on top of a mound called the Awful, that is actually where the original temple once stood. And just to the south of that, and I mean just meters south, was the City of David, also known as the Citadel. And the entire city of Jerusalem, with the temple, stood in that area right there. The reason we know that it's there is because Josephus, the Jewish historian, who lived in Jerusalem, and he was there and present at the destruction of Jerusalem, and he saw it in a destroyed condition afterwards, and he was given the Jewish records of King Herod as to the construction of Fort Antonia, and he was given the Roman records in regard to the Jewish wars, who did what when and who destroyed what, and how the war progressed. Josephus was a first century historian. He was Jewish, a uh, commander that was a uh, conscripted to be sort of a, a historian of sorts. Um, his writing is, Im is impeccably accurate. Uh, people say, oh, he's so great of a historian, except when he's talking about the temple. 
And then, then he just seems to have this weird perception of history. No, he had a perfect perception of history. He knew where the temple was. He knew it was destroyed down the very foundations. So historians say, well, he was great up until he talked about the temple. But no, he was right about the temple. We have been wrong. So I, I think we should follow the first century eyewitness as opposed to a 21st century guessing ob uh, observant person. He's an excellent, terrific source for the information that that piece of land is Fortress Antonia because nothing suits that description that Josephus gives us. He says it was larger than the temple. He says it was more massive, bulky, the greater fortifications than the temple. It obscured the temple from the north vantage point if you would approach Jerusalem from the north. And uh, everything fits Fortress Antonia being that structure of the Haram as Sharif. Nothing else fits. So if it was the Roman Fort Antonia that stood on the Temple Mount or the Haram al Sharif and not the Jewish temples, what was the rock that is enshrined within the Dome of the Rock? Well, there's, there's a lot of people that have uh, questioned what, what is the rock doing under the Dome of the Rock. That's, the, that's pretty much what it was named after. Um, I, I'm, I'm really interested in what the Bordeaux pilgrim said in 333 AD uh, when he was at the Church of the Sep Holy Sepulchre. He, looked, he, he said he looked due west and all he could see was the long wall of the Roman fortress. That's very interesting because when you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and look west, all you see is the long, long wall of the Temple Mount. So according to the Bordeaux Pilgrim, and what I can understand he is relaying through his words, is that he's actually looking at the Roman fortress and he is describing also that that rock was the praetorium where the, where the prisoners would have stood on this rock when they were pronounced guilty. I think that's one of the most interesting uh, I, you know, thought process on what is that dome of the rock. But what can we prove that that rock was? Uh, some people say it was the rock in the Holy of Holies. Impossible. The Holy of Holies is 30 feet by 30 feet. The rock is 52 feet by, you know, uh, whatever. But it's, it's certainly not a rock that would be in the Holy of Holies. You know, the small rock where the Ark of the Covenant went on was, was a slab. It wasn't a rock like this. Uh, so what was this rock? It's interesting. When you look at this rock, what you'll find on the top of the rock is you'll find crosses in it, you know. Because it wasn't a rock that was sacred to Judaism, and certainly wasn't a rock that was sacred to Islam, it wasn't even involved back then. But it was a rock that the early believers, as early as the third century, we can prove this from the historical records, thought that rock was the rock that was in the Praetorium. So the belief was that that was the rock Yeshua got on top of and gave his defense before Pilate. So knowing that, and there was a tradition that came after that, it almost looked like there were footprints in that rock, and uh, some of those Christians were believing these were the footprints of Yeshua, and they built a church around it in the third century, the Church of uh, St. Cyrus, and then the Church of the Holy Wisdom that came after that. But clearly that rock was a Christian edifice, nothing to do with Judaism and nothing else. In 70 AD, the Romans decided to put a final end to Jewish rebellion, and Titus, the son of Roman Emperor Vespasian, marched on Jerusalem with 65,000 men and torched the entire city, and the temple. Pretty much was eradicated. Uh, Eliezer in 73, uh, during the, who was the, the general of Masada, said, Masada said that uh, everything, in dis everything was with utter destruction, except for that of the camp of the Romans, which is the Roman fort. So everything was destroyed. So I think that when you talk about in 70 AD what was destroyed, I think the temple was destroyed to the very foundations, Josephus said, that you wouldn't even know that there was a city there where the temple stood in 70 AD, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Jesus in Matthew 24, who's, when he said that all the stones, every stone, utterly, completely, and totally down to the very foundations would be destroyed. So I think we have a fulfillment of prophecy if we correctly identify where the correct location of the temple is located. Fort Antonia remained on the Haram as Sharif uh, under different names. In other words, when did it stop being Fort Antonia? Mm -hmm. uh, after Jerusalem was destroyed, it had a different name 
it was actually the center of Elia Capitolina, which was the renamed terminology for the city of Jerusalem. King or Emperor Hadrian decided to eliminate Jerusalem by changing the name and causing uh, the reconstruction of the entire city. And it became to be quite a large city. And for a long period of time, it was a Roman fortress uh, housing the 10th Legion Fratensis uh, until about 300 years, 250 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. That 10th Legion was based there. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD, and then it really wasn't much of a city until it was uh, rebuilt uh, and renamed Alia Capitolia, uh, which, uh, which, which is, was its new name. Uh, and it was, it was a new city. So that, then it really took an, a very strong uh, resurgence after the time of Constantine. Uh, when Constantine built the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, then it really started taking off again. And then from, and from then on, it, it, had a, it had a steady growth up until the time of um, uh, the Crusades in 1099. Took another growth spurt there, and then it's pretty much stabilized after that, after the Muslims had it uh, in the seventh century. There's a lot of argument as to when people started believing that the temple was on the Temple Mount. My, my personal belief is that when the, in 1099, when the Crusaders conquered the, uh, the Temple Mount complex today, and they saw the Muslim dome with the crescent moon on it, they ripped it off, they put a cross on there, called it the uh, Templum Domini, which is Latin for the Lord's Temple. And from that point on, it became very popular throughout Europe that that was the temple area. Uh, people did argue about it for some extent. They didn't know where the real temple was. But in time, they, they just settled on it. Uh, there was a man named Tudela, Benjamin Tudela in the 12th century, very charismatic man, uh, uh, rabbi. And he said, hey guys, let's just settle on this. And people have, and tradition has sent its taproot down and taken root in the, both the church and both the Jewish belief systems. And from that point on, it's become historical fact when I think it's been terribly, terribly mangled in history and we have a wrong perception of where the temple is located uh, traditionally because it should be in the city of David. From where we are on the Mount of Olives, we can see behind us the graves of thousands of Jews who wanted to be buried here. Uh, why? Why did they want to be buried right here, right up against the Mount of Olives? Well, according to Zechariah, the Messiah is going to return to the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is going to cleave in half. Half is going to go toward the north, half toward the south. And the Jews as well believe this is where the resurrection is going to take place. But of course, the Jews believe that the Messiah can't come until the temple is rebuilt. So if it could be shown that the temple never stood where the Dome of the Rock now stands, but stood somewhere else, then that would solve the problem. It would, Chris, because that temple right there, the Dome of the Rock, is uh, the most contested piece of real estate in the entire world. It could be a trigger for World War III. And if it could be proved, and not only proved, but accepted, that that temple stood on the awful south of Fort Antonia, it could bring about some type of a peace covenant. What do you mean by a peace covenant? The Jewish prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 prophesied that there would be a world leader that would arise and would confirm some type of a covenant that would bring some measure of tranquility to the Middle East. Even now as wars are raging in Yemen, Libya, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia is involved, this would bring about some uh, measure of peace to this situation. And it would then also allow the Jews to rebuild their temple and begin their animal sacrifice once again. Now I want to underline that the rebuilding of the Jewish temple is a very important milestone in the sequence of end time events. And there can be many interpretations of Bible prophecy, who the Antichrist is, when he's gonna come, even whether we're living in the end times at all. But when 
the Jewish temple is rebuilt, then we know for sure that we're in the last seven years. And we lock in to a very definite sequence of events as foretold in the books of Daniel, Revelation, and many other prophetic passages in the Bible. Yes, the temple's very significant in end time Bible prophecy. It's where the Antichrist finally declares that he is God, tries to bring about the end of the worship of the true God. It's also where he uh, places what is known as the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet and quoted by Jesus in Matthew 24. This abomination of desolation, or the image of the beast, as John calls him in the book of Revelation, do we know what it is, or what it's likely to be? Well, there are those who have speculated, and rightly so, that it could be some type of supercomputer combined with what the transhumanists are now pushing forward, as well as changes in the genome system. Science is putting it all together. Never before in world history that we know of has it been possible to track every man, woman, and child. But the Bible does talk in Revelations 13 about the mark of the beast, the famous 666. And somehow this abomination of desolation it is what is going to be able to put that into practice and try and force people and cause people to take the mark of the beast that no man may be able to buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. It all comes down to economics, Chris. If you don't have it, you can't buy and you can't sell. But none of this can happen until the third Jewish temple is built. This is an artist's conception of how the temple would look built on the Haram al-Sharif. Already, the Jewish Sanhedrin has appointed the high priest, and everything has been prepared for the ritual of daily sacrifice to resume after almost 2,000 years. And if the Jewish people could accept the overwhelming evidence that the temples never stood on the Haram al-Sharif or the Temple Mount, then construction of the coming temple could begin immediately. But will it? Or is tradition too strong? I think traditions are too strong until uh, an event occurs which makes people really look at the facts. Um, so until that time, I think we're going to have tradition is going to be stronger than historical fact. But Tradition can change, but it takes a wrecking ball event to make that change in paradigm. Because like I said, that spirit of tradition overrides the truth. So that's what we're dealing with down there. And that's what I say. What I say is, look, there is enough evidence that I could prove to anybody that the temple was in the city of David and it wasn't on the Hiram. If I'm wrong, prove me wrong. Let's start dialogue. You know, if somebody can start a dialogue, and I've been looking for it for 15 years. You know, I'm not an argumentative person. I'll sit down, I'll listen to what has to be said. Prove me wrong, you know, prove Dr. Martin wrong. And yet up to this point, the problem isn't that they can't prove us wrong. The problem is they don't even want to start a dialogue. In this film, you've heard the opinions of a few of a growing number of archaeologists, historians, and academics who are convinced that the first and second Jewish temples never stood on the Temple Mount or the Haram al-Sharif. If they're right, then there's nothing to stop the third Jewish temple being built immediately in the city of David on the southeast ridge of Jerusalem. One thing is certain. According to Bible prophecy, the temple will be rebuilt. And both Jews and Christians are looking forward to that. Day.